In this video, we'll look at the basics of amplitude modulation and asynchronous demodulation. Here's a block diagram of a basic sinusoidal AM transmitter. What we're looking at here is in the time domain. We'll deal with the frequency domain on the next slide. So basically the transmitter um, is, a, is a simple system here. We've got an information signal coming in here. This is X of T. And uh, for example, this could be an audio signal from voice or music or something like that. It might have a frequency of a few kilohertz. What happens in this uh, transmitter is that X of T, the information signal, is multiplied by a high frequency carrier signal. Um, this is done through a circuit called an oscillator that produces, for example, a cosine function um, at the carrier frequency. And notice that the carrier frequency is considerably higher. For example, it might be 800 kilohertz. This would correspond to a radio station on the AM dial at AM 800. So when these two signals are multiplied together, we get the modulated carrier. And we already looked at this in a previous video as to how amplitude modulation works. But basically, when uh, X of T and C of T, the carrier, are multiplied together, we see that when the signal goes high, we get a large amplitude um, in the output here. And likewise, when the signal goes low, we get a small amplitude. So we have amplitude modulation. And our output, which is sent to the antenna and then broadcast, uh, we're going to call that R of T. And again, that's the product of X of T and C of T. So this whole process is the modulation portion of an AM transmitter. Now let's take a look at this situation in the frequency domain. So here's the spectrum of X of T. So remember, X of T was our information signal. For example, it might be an audio signal from a radio station. Um, what we have here is a band-limited signal. For example, uh, for audio, it might have a bandwidth of about 5 kilohertz. And we're just going to assume the spectrum of the audio signal has uh, the shape shown here. All right, now remember we're multiplying the um, X of T, the information signal. We're multiplying that by the carrier frequency, where C of T, our carrier, um, is a cosine function, cosine of omega C T, where omega C is the carrier frequency. And again, this carrier, fre carrier frequency um, is typically going to be a very high frequency. For example, in Hertz, it might be something like 800 kilohertz, if that's the particular station. So this is the spectrum of the carrier. Remember, for a cosine function, we have two spikes in the spectrum at the frequency of the cosine signal. So in this case, um, these delta functions here would correspond to the carrier frequency of, say, 800 kilohertz. Now, we're multiplying X of T times the carrier C of T to get our output R of T. So in the time domain, we're doing multiplication. Well, we're going to use the convolution property here, which says that multiplication in the time domain leads to convolution in the frequency domain. In other words, in the frequency domain, our output here, R of J omega, the spectrum of our output, is found by the convolution of X and C. So we need to do a convolution of this signal here with this signal here. And um, this is actually done, there's several ways to do this, but the easy way to visualize this is remember that these are delta functions. And all delta functions do uh, when we do a convolution integral is basically sample the other signal that it's being multiplied with. So in this case, what happens is our original audio signal here, which was centered at zero frequency here, has now been shifted up to the carrier frequency. In fact, we see two copies of it. There's one here centered at omega C, and the other, um, as always, is centered at minus omega C. So this is our modulated carrier signal. This is what's actually transmitted or broadcast over the airwaves. Notice it has the same exact shape. We have the information here, our audio information, but it's been shifted up in frequency by the process of modulation. So let's take a look at this convolution 
and we can sort of visualize how it's done uh, with this um, animation that I'm going to show you here. So remember what we're doing here is we're saying that the output of the transmitter, R of T, is the product of X of T, which is the information or the audio signal, times the carrier frequency signal, which is C of T. And um, this is in the time domain. And again, in the frequency domain, um, the spectrum R of J omega, which is the transform of R of T, um, is found by taking the convolution of the two transforms of X and C. So one way to think about convolution is that we have one signal basically sliding across the frequency axis here. And as it overlaps our, uh, impulse, uh, our impulses here, we get a copy of the signal here for R of J omega. So let's run the animation and see what happens here. So what we saw here is starting way over on the left, we took our audio spectrum. And as we slid it across here, when it overlapped this um, frequency component here at minus omega C, we got the output here, which is just a copy of our audio signal. And it's copied at this carrier frequency, minus omega C. And then it moves across the um, frequency axis like this. And there's, there's no, or I should do it up here rather, and, but there was no overlap in this portion. Therefore, the output has nothing here at zero frequency. But once we got our X of J omega to overlap this delta function at omega C, we produce another copy here at the carrier frequency. So this is basically an animation showing how the convolution works. And again, the, the main idea here is that this original audio frequency, which was centered here at zero, has now been moved up to the carrier frequency at omega C. And this is what's broadcast and sent to the antenna and sent through the airwaves. So now we've done the transmission. Now we have to do the receiving end of this uh, AM communication system. So what I'm gonna show here is called synchronous demodulation. So one way to demodulate, or in other words, get the information signal back out of the modulated carrier is to do something called synchronous sinusoidal AM demodulation. And the way this works, um, it looks very much like the transmitter. We have an oscillator circuit again that produces the same carrier frequency. For example, 800 kilohertz is what we used in another example. So again, we're gonna take the modulated carrier here, which is sent over the airwaves. It's picked up by the antenna. Uh, remember, we're calling this R of T because that's what came out of the transmitter. So that's what goes into the receiver. We're multiplying that again by the carrier uh, frequency C of T. And the output is called Y of T. Now, we're going to see what happens. We can't really tell uh, in the time domain here. But when we look at the frequency domain, we're going to find out that this process actually produces another copy of the original signal at low frequencies and we can use a low pass filter to select that copy that's at low frequency and reject all the high frequency copies. And the net result is what we get out is the original information signal. So in order to make some sense of this, let's take a look at this in the frequency domain. So again, here is R of J omega. This was the um, modulated carrier that was sent out by the transmitter. This is what's picked up by the antenna. Remember, we have the audio signal here, but it's been uh, shifted up in frequency to the high frequency carrier, omega C. So again, we're gonna multiply in the time domain this uh, signal here by the carrier signal. And so again, this is the carrier, the same carrier signal that we saw before. It's two delta functions sitting at the carrier frequency. Now, when we do this convolution again, what happens this time is we not only get high frequency copies of the audio, but we get another copy back where it originally was. This is in the audio frequency range. So again, the easiest way to see this is by running an animation, which you'll see on the next slide. 
All right, so uh, recall that convolution again, we can visual, or visualize it as taking our um, signal here, R of J omega, and sliding it across the frequency axis. And wherever it overlaps these delta functions here, we're gonna get a copy down here. Now the difference is we're starting with two copies here for R of J omega. And as they slide across these two delta functions, it's gonna actually produce three copies here. So let's watch the animation. So here it comes. So now we're, we're doing one overlap, that produces the first copy. Now notice these are both overlapping, that produces the center copy. And then finally, this one overlaps with the rightmost delta function to produce this copy here. So let's take a look at where these copies are placed. Um, this one here, notice, is placed at twice the carrier frequency. So that's going to be um, an extremely high frequency in this case, and we're not interested in that at all. And the same goes for this um, copy over here at, the, at minus 2 omega c. This is the one that's important. The, this one here is placed back centered at zero frequency. In other words, this is the original audio spectrum, and it's back at where it started. So the last step in order to extract this audio spectrum from the rest of the frequencies here is just by using a simple low pass filter that will reject these high frequency copies. They are rejected and we pass this low frequency copy of the audio signal and this is what we started with. So this is the final step for this demodulation. So here's a... Um, Sort of a summary of what we've done here we've got the transmitter here also called the modulator where we have an information signal multiplied by a carrier that's the the process of modulation which is shown here that's sent out by the antenna the transmitting antenna um, that same signal is picked up by the receiving antenna it's again multiplied by the carrier uh, same carrier frequency here um, another oscillator and then that output is sent through a low pass filter which extracts the original um, information signal. In our case, it's an audio signal, and we get the signal to come out there. So this is the receiving um, end of the communication system, uh, which is also called the demodulator. Now, one word of caution here. Um, this is not a very practical um, communication system for a transmitter and receiver that are separated by any considerable distance. The reason for this is these two oscillators here, the transmitter oscillator and the receiver oscillator, have to be perfectly synchronized. This is why this is called synchronous, um, a synchronous amplitude modulation. Um, there can't be any change or any difference in the two frequencies and no difference in even phases. Um, and so this is actually a very difficult, if not impossible, task um, again, especially in most cases where the receiver is far away from the transmitter. In this slide here, we can show the problems with synchronous demodulation. If there is a phase difference between the transmitter oscillator here and the receiver oscillator here. So remember what's being transmitted um, is the signal R of T, which is the product of X of T and C of T. So let's let C of T our carrier uh, signal be uh, a cosine uh, function, cosine of omega CT. So that signal is received by the receiver here. And it remember, it's multiplied again by the same uh, carrier frequency. So we have cosine omega CT again. However, this time we're going to intentionally add a phase angle here, uh, phi. And let's see the effect that this has. So notice our output now is the what's coming into the receiver, X of T cosine omega CT, multiplied by the uh, this signal here, cosine of omega CT plus phi. So all of this stuff is what is picked up now by the receiver. And then of course that thing is uh, sent through a low pass filter. The problem is here, um, if these two, um, if phi happens to be the right angle, we can actually completely nullify what's coming out of the receiver here. And the easiest way to show that is, um, you know, here's our signal Y of T, which is coming out of the receiver. It's got these two cosines multiplied times each other. 
So we can use a trig identity of uh, cosine alpha times cosine beta is equal to one half cosine alpha plus beta plus one half cosine alpha minus beta. You can look these trig identities up uh, anywhere. All right, so applying this, what happens then is our output y of t using that trig identity is one half x of t, which is our signal, times cosine of two omega ct plus phi. Um, notice that this, this term here though, has a frequency that's twice the carrier. That's gonna be removed by the low pass filter anyway. So we don't really have to worry about this. We're not gonna see this anyway. This is the important one. This is what actually is going to be coming out of our receiver. And the good news is, notice inside here is X of T. That's our original audio signal, which is what we want to get. The bad news is that it's multiplied by the cosine of the phase angle phi. Remember, we're using phi to model some phase difference between the transmitter and the receiver. So depending on what phi is, um, that, can, uh, um, that can be very harmful to what's received by this receiver or what comes out of the receiver. So for example, if phi happens to be zero, meaning there's no phase difference, well, that's good because the cosine of zero is just one. And so we get our signal coming out of this um, receiver here. We get our audio signal, which is what we want. However, if the phase angle, let's say drifts over time, to pi over two radians or 90 degrees, well, the cosine of 90 degrees is zero. So what that means then is the output goes to zero and the output of our receiver actually vanishes due to the phase difference. So this is a severe limitation for synchronous demodulation. Um, there, the uh, good news is we have a, uh, a good solution to this and it's called asynchronous demodulation. And that is the subject of another video.